In this episode, we'll be looking at migration. What is migration? Why do and how do people migrate? Is migration a new thing? To help give us some perspective on what migration is and its effects on, uh, on Africa, the African diaspora, is Professor Mojuba Olu, Olufunke Okome. Professor Okome is an international political economist whose regional specialization is on the African continent. She was educated at University of Ibadan in Nigeria, Long Island University in New York, and Columbia University, also in New York. She's a professor of political science at Brooklyn University. She's a past Women's Studies Program Director and past Deputy Chair for Graduate Studies in the Department of Political Science at Brooklyn College. Her research interests include youth empowerment, gender, democracy, and citizenship in Africa, effects of globalization, and African diaspora studies. Her most recent publications are two edited books, State Fragility, State Formation, and Human Security in Nigeria, and Contesting the Nigerian State, Civil Society, and the Contradictions of Self-Organization. Welcome to Sankofa Pan-Africa series, uh, Professor Mojuba Olu. Olufunke Okome. Thank you very much. We're going to be talking about uh, migration because it's been, I mean, uh, before the pandemic, it was one of the most um, uh, topical news uh, items, uh, um, especially if you've been keeping abreast with the uh, goings on in, in Europe. So when we mention migration, you know, some of the most disturbing images that come to mind are. Uh, uh, people make, try, making unsafe uh, uh, migration and backing on unsafe migration um, to Europe in, uh, in boats and things like that. Um, please, can you give us a brief historical background of what migration is with a particular emphasis on, on Africa? Okay, so the way I think about migration, and I think this is actually in line with most of the mainstream um, definitions. It's about movement from one place to another. Human movement, of course, because we also know that um, animals that are not human, they migrate. So um, it's movement from one place to the other, and it's as old as humanity. Well, if we're thinking about human migration, since it's been established that Africa is the birthplace of humanity. The original migration of human beings occurred from the African continent into the other continents. And you know, there are people who also study geology and all that who said that we had um, a whole um, sphere before and then the continents came apart, you know, as a result of geological movements and whatever. But when I think about migration, I think about human beings who deliberately or um, unwillingly move from one place to the other. I actually am not um, thrilled to include the first migration that entails the enslavement of one people by another and moving them unwillingly to a place that they did not intend to go to. I think that we should separate totally. But you know, many people do not make that separation. When they talk about migration, they'll talk about, well, there's a volitional movement, which is something that you willingly um, make a decision to do. And that is assumed to not be um, constraining, you know, that a person just chooses to move from one place to another. And there are so many different uh, explanations that scholars give about that. You know, there are mainstream uh, neoliberal scholars who just make an economic argument. You are an individual, you see better economic opportunities elsewhere, 
and you do the cost benefit analysis, you move to take advantage of those better economic conditions. Of course, they do not really um, think about non-economic issues that might compel a person to move from one place to the other. In the old um, migration literature, people used to talk about push and pull, you know. So there are factors that push you from where you are resident. That, and then factors that pull you into the place that you choose to go to or that you are going to anyway. Um, nowadays, people have said that we should stop with this push and pull thing because this is a whole complex um, set of decision making. And then there are structures, there are institutions that either facilitate or repel migration. So let me just quickly say that the original migration of human beings was also, I mean, we cannot ever talk about total volition, that you have a choice, you know, because we know that even those old migrations um, were caused by sometimes, you know, a, a, a population of people are uh, seeing that they're exhausting the resources that they need in order to, um, to, to be able to exist, to be able to live. So a group might move and go find more resources. There's also movement that happens because people are in conflict, you know, and sometimes that conflict might be generational. The younger people are feeling oppressed by the older people, they move. There's conflict that's, um, that's um, a result also of serious compulsion. I mean, people who lose wars usually uh, either moved or they have to move, you know. So there are all these interesting aspects of migration. Um, then there's also, you know, I talked about the resource, um, um, the, the, the inadequacy of resources forcing people to move. Nowadays, people are paying more attention to those things. But, you know, I think people who um, studied human migration were aware that these things were in play originally anyway, mm -hmm. because environmental changes mm -hmm. can lead to things like drought. Mm -hmm. And drought, if it's not managed well, or if the environmental conditions are harsh enough, that drought can lead to famine. No human mm -hmm. population would sit in one place and wait to die. So they will go look for more resources. And we saw this happening in ancient times, prehistoric times. We're seeing it happening today as well. The unfortunate thing about um, this kind of environmentally uh, propelled migration is that most of it, I think, is happening in the global south. So this is about also um, human capacity to access the, um, the economic, social, and political resources that they need in order to make life work for them in any terrain that they are in. And because you know, we've had a history of exploitation of the global south by the global north, you know, um, inadequacy is experienced more intensely in the global south. Yeah. And Africa is in the global south. Good. Africa also, you know, if we're thinking about all these kinds of migration, the original migration, the enslavement of Africans and forcefully taking them from the continent to the new world and to Europe in order to, um, to be used as tools for economic productivity by those who enslaved them, you know. We also so, now look at the history of migration vis-a-vis -vis, um, Europe and the, the development of Europe and the Americas. Because yeah, so that, that's what I'm talking migration about. Migration was at the uh, uh, was at the bottom of the, of whatever developments they now have. Okay, so you know, um, like I said before, the original human beings moved from Africa they came into the other continents and settled. As a result of environmental conditions, we have the differences in skin, color, 
in, you know, as a result of adaptation that people had to make, you know, you have differences in feature. But all of humanity is from one species. Yes. Right? yes. So then, you know, in order for there to be um, increased economic productivity in Europe, Europe um, saw places like Africa as places from which it could um, just grab people, take them to Europe, take them later to the new world, and use them for free in order to generate wealth. So the wealth of Europe depends on the exploitation of labor from other continents. From the background that you've given, you know, um, so various people, groups of people, nations have actually used various forms of migrations to develop themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when we now see migration being painted in a negative light, shouldn't we question it? Um, you know, so I, I think we should. And actually, one of the bases on which we should question um, these xenophobic approaches to migration is to remind those who are making those arguments. Mm -hmm. Now, when the, um, in the post-Second World War period, Pax Americana established a liberal international system. That liberal system the essence of liberalism is freedom, you know? Yes. So they're supposed to be freedom of movement. And if you look at many of the international, um, you know, um, uh, conventions and so forth, they talk about freedom, you know? There's also supposed to be, you see that freedom when you look at the economy, you know, free trade. Primary beneficiary of free trade is the most powerful, Mm -hmm. actor, you know, and this is, you know, so the free trade is almost a misnomer, but you Thank know, there's you. a way in which um, powerful uh, actors in international politics tend to use a play of words to convince people who are being exploited that whatever exploitation they're doing is for their own good, you know. <laughs> so free trade is not to be taken as good trade. Thank you. It is not fair trade. Thank free you. Free trade benefits the powerful. You know the hypocrisy of this whole migration um, regime is that actually Europe and the U.S., they need labor they could not do without migrant and immigrant workers. The U.S., the, in the case of the U.S., it's even more hypocritical because this country says we are a country of immigrants. Yes. Of course, that has its own problems because we have to forget about the Native Americans who originally owned the land mm -hmm. in order to buy that discourse of yes. the nation of immigrants. Yes. But this country is presented as a country that is welcoming to immigrants. The Statue of Liberty itself yeah, bring me your is a symbol your of that kind of uh, yeah. embrace. Bring me your tired, your poor, well, yeah. and all that. Okay, so, but on a, if you look at most American, middle class and wealthy American households, they cannot do. Women cannot be professionals without having nannies, women who are mothers, without having nannies who are predominantly third world people. They're coming from the global south. Mm -hmm. Many of those women leave their own children to come and be either maids or uh, nannies here to take care of other people's children. Mm -hmm. The restaurants, look at, if you look at the staff in the restaurants, they're predominantly new immigrants. If you look at the service economy, it's full of immigrants. Look at the nurses. They're from the third, you know, in, in the US, Filipino nurses, African nurses, West Indian nurses are 
predominant population, even yeah. in terms of the doctors, you know, it's a lot of immigrants. Now, professors, there are so many Nigerian professors here, you know. Um, so, um, and then if you look at it, the people who are harvesting crops are also immigrants. So how is this, if immigrants stop working for one week, mm -hmm. the economy of the United States of America and the economy of Europe will okay. crash. And you can see that in the COVID era because Portugal um, and some other European states are deciding to put a moratorium on their immigration laws and allow for immigrant workers to harvest crops because they don't, if the, if the immigrant workers don't, all these crops are going to spoil and it's going yeah. to cause a food crisis and so on yeah. and so forth. So they need workers. They are also countries like Italy that cannot replace their population without mm -hmm. having immigration. So they need a changing population. Now, they do not want everybody. They want a certain kind of people. So I think their first choice is to have white people. Their second choice is to have non-white people who are highly educated, you know. But they know they also need people to do manual labor. So if you restrict, if you put strict immigration conditions on the ground, somebody could have a PhD and come into your country and be forced to be picking tomatoes. You know, oh, yes. Because oh, yes. they do not have documentation. Yeah. Okay. Somebody could be uh, an engineer and be driving a taxi. Oh. You know. So, you know, there is a lot of hypocrisy, a lot of racism, and a lot of exploitation. So if you make conditions hard and you uh, criminalize migration, then people are going to be scared uh, enough to just take any wages in order to survive, you know? So, and I thought that we were making a breakthrough in terms of the migration uh, regime when around the end of the Obama administration, they said, oh, we need to have a global migration discussion and they started it. But the US was leading that and now with the Trump administration, the, the US is more interested in criminalizing, vilifying, yes. brutalizing immigrants and stirring up xenophobia towards mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So what I'm arguing in brief is the economies of Europe and the US, the economies of the global north, and Japan, by the way, they need immigrant labor. Okay, but in order to get that immigrant labor cheaply, they are not going to put laws in place that enable for people to live their lives in dignity with the right paperwork so that they can do the work that they are trained for. It's for them better to exploit people, put them in all these substandard uh, places where people are forced to live, you know, those camps and act as if these are people who are disposable, you know. Meanwhile, they need them, okay? So it's a, it's a strong hold on the economic South. Yes. Our, our natal homes, you know, are rendered virtually inhabitable by all kinds of, um, you know, um, economic, um, international economic policies, and then, when people try to get out to, to look for uh, uh, better places, uh, better future for themselves and their, and their offspring, they are criminalized. So what is the way forward? Okay. How do we remove these hands that are strangling, you know, that, that are this chokehold? Okay, so let me quickly on, on kind of talk south. about causes of migration, because I think we've concentrated on the economic. Mm -hmm. And it's important, you know, but in, in terms of the migration regime, economic um, um, causes of migration are treated as if they are illegitimate. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. So conflict, however, 
is treated as a serious uh, enough um, reason why a person would want to move. So there's an international refugee convention. Yes. Okay. Now, you would also notice that many of the global north countries are not respecting the refugee convention. Because the refugee convention has this law, it's a French word, non reformer or whatever, <laughs> that, you know, if a person um, comes and claims refugee status, you are, not, you are not supposed to send them back to the place where they have a well-founded fear of persecution, and you are supposed to, or where they, their life is in danger, you are supposed to give them a chance to show you evidence that they are facing those conditions. Mm. And until that process is over, it's usually a lengthy, lengthy process, you are not supposed to deport that person. I want to also say that the majority of African immigrants are actually in African soil. You know, they haven't left Africa. They go mm. from one African country to other African yeah. countries. Yeah. Okay? Majority of African refugees are also in the African continent. So you have this paradox where majority of the countries that are receiving and welcoming to immigrants and refugees are actually poor countries themselves. Mm. Okay? So let's lay that aside. Another cause of migration is environmental. You have desertification that's happening, and we can just focus on the Lake Chad Basin mm. uh, region. In that region, there's encroachment of desert. Lake Chad itself has dried up to just a fraction of its original size. This is causing people to move because they need water. You know, mm -hmm. people who also were fishermen and women, uh, they need a new means of livelihood. People who have livestock, they need That's water, me. they need grass for their livestock. You know, so this is causing population of people who are doing all those, um, all that kind of um, work to move into areas that they didn't um, occupy before. Now, there are people who occupy that land. It's causing conflict, okay? Mm. There are also people who are fleeing from conflict, and we can think of any number of cases in the African continent. So the environmental refugees, the conflict-produced refugees, are not supposed to be turned away by anybody and they're being turned away. Now, people have paid more attention to the Syrians, okay? Yes. Because um, the Middle East is more important yes. to the powerful <laughs> countries in the scheme of things because mm. of their geopolitics. Mm. So, so we kind of don't see other uh, movements of people because people don't cover them until people die in large numbers. But we don't even cover all the deaths, okay? So... The deaths in the Sahara, nobody's covering that. Mm. There's horrors that's happening in Libya, and we focus on Libya, not remembering that the Europeans are actually also responsible for some of what is happening in North Africa. Because what they are, the arrangement they have with, with uh, North African countries that are close to their borders is that they should stop these migrants from coming. Okay, mm -hmm. so they are paying those countries to do this work of stopping the migrants. The, um, the, the, the horrors in Libya is because the person they were paying before has now been eliminated, Gaddafi. And so there are so many other, um, you know, local um, powerful interests that have taken over. And there's a lot of, um, what would I call it, anarchy in Libya, and that is what is producing this. But the Europeans do not want um, people to have an easy passage into their land, and they have extended their borders, you know, to the high seas, and then to uh, the shores of these North African countries, even sometimes to other countries in the continent. So, you know, I think there's, um, there's cause for alarm, because it seems as if um, we are comfortable with the 
um, the uncertainties and the um, brutalities and the fatalities that occur for many irregular migrants, you know, who make these dangerous passages because they have nothing else going or, or you know, they kind of feel that using their cost benefit analysis, if I go, if I can just make it to Europe, I'm mm -hmm. going to be able to make enough money to take care of my family. And mm -hmm. you can see this in the ways in which people make economic decisions. Mm -hmm. Remittances have been recognized now as a very huge contributor to national development. In some mm -hmm. African countries, remittances are larger than official development assistance from mm. global north countries, mm. you know. And Nigeria, because of its share size, actually is the African country that um, has the most remittances from its people in diaspora, you know, that either send charity or emergency assistance or investment capital back home mm. to their home country. So I think also on the side of the African countries, there's an interest in having migration continue. Hmm. First of all, there's this remittances. Secondly, it's like a way of letting off steam because the people who would stay and make trouble about calling on the state to provide resources that the state ought to provide, if you let them go, then there's less wahala. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, um, both on the side of the African state, and on the side of the global north states, you have this very cynical kind of policies where there's recognition that people produce value, you know, that mm. many of these people have skills. And actually, if you look at North America, you would find that majority of I mean, uh, Africans, uh, they have the highest levels of education compared yeah, with it's, anybody. It's the reason why most of us left compared our with home. Anybody. And then Nigerians actually also are at the top levels when you consider yeah. Africans. So these, many of these people are not people who are unskilled. They're not people. And then their job, um, their, their workforce participation is high, of the highest levels. These are mm. hardworking people. These are people who have skills. These are people who have education. Mm. What you also find, unfortunately, is that the earnings that are uh, available to them and the economic opportunities that are available to them amount to, in terms of the economic opportunities, underemployment, because they're not using all their skills. Mm. In terms of earnings, they're not earning at uh, levels that are commensurate with their uh, level of education and their experience, mm. you know. So this is exploitative, but you know, when people are making the cost benefit analysis and you're thinking about the exchange rate of dollars to Naira, uh, mm. when they come here, they are able to, um, you know, uh, to, 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 to make economic sense of making that move because our economy is in the doldrums. Mm. as a result of the structural adjustment. But mm. I remember I came to the U.S. in 1981. You take one Naira and you get two dollars. Mm. Yes, that's the condition under which I came. Now it's almost about time, than 50. Thank you. Naira so, you know, when you think about those kinds of exchange rates, the, any kind of rational economic actor would find earning dollars to be more, um, just makes more sense than earning Naira, you know. So we allow the global north to make economic calculus and decide where they can make profit and go there. But we do not allow the global south to do that. Thank you. And we don't discuss that when we talk about human rights, when we talk about equity, when yeah. we talk about justice, when we talk about migration. You know, and I think all these things have to be brought to the table. And one thing that COVID is showing us, right, is that the world now has an opportunity 
to take seriously matters of equity, mm. matters of economic justice, mm. matters of, you know, even just human security. Yes. So that we realize that we are all in this together. Yeah. You, know? you, you cannot remain COVID free if it continues exactly. to ravage places in the economic south. So exactly. it is, it is our what problem. Seeing, it seems as if the economic south is actually not suffering as much, you know, from this COVID. I don't know why, you know. Um, so what we need to do also as the global south, when the age of colonization was ending, there, were the, there was the group of 77, which became the non-aligned movement. Mm. What people were saying at that time was that there needed to be redistribution. And you know, um, the, there were discussions about the new international economic order in the United Nations system. Those talks, they were exciting. They took place in the 1980s and uh, up until the early 90s and they fizzled out because the global north does not want to redistribute. Mm. It does not want equity. It does not want economic justice. I think those talks have to be revived you know and, and you know um, that we have a lot of resources that we own in our soil on our land including human resources you know it is about time that we took hold of our own uh, circumstances but you know you can't do that without power mm. so undergirding all all these arrangements is the fact that there's military power, mm. and that advantage lies with the global north. I think that it is about time that we had a rethinking of how to reorganize our world. But nobody is going to hand that to us yes. in the global south, and we cannot get it as individual countries. Right? What roles can Africans in diaspora play? you know, in bringing about this, you know, reorganizing of, of, of uh, the global economy, of the uh, equity, and all of that. What role can we play? Can people in diaspora play? And by, by Africans in diaspora, I'm not only talking about African uh, immigrants. Mm -hmm. I'm also talking about an alliance between you know, African Americans, you know, African Canadians, people who have been you know, he, uh, uh, um, in diaspora for generations. Okay. Um, so I think we can dream. I believe in dreaming because, and I believe in hope. Hope is the weapon of the powerless. So let's go back again and realize that Africans in the diaspora, in collaboration and partnership with Africans from the continent, they had pan-Africanism. Okay. Mm. And there were those Pan-African congresses that were very, they, dream, they dreamt big yeah. about all African peoples, regardless of where they are in yeah. the world, yeah. uniting in order to build Africa and contribute to African development. Now, one of the things we do when we look at failure of social and political movements from producing the intended um, objective is that we tend to blame the people who have failed. We fail to see that, you know, there's actually, this is, these are power relations in which these people are engaged. So you want to take power away from those who have it. You want to deny them easy access to the resources that they have taken, whether you like it or not. And nobody considers that there's going to be a pushback. And mm -hmm. you saw that with the Pan-African movement, it got up to mm -hmm. a certain level and it was not even able to bring African unity. The OAU that was produced was the vision of those who didn't believe in Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that we need to do is to become united, more united. And what I say, or maybe form coalitions, you know, because we also have to realize that we do not have identical interests. So we need to form coalitions 
And those coalitions have to be with the objective of reviving the spirit of Pan-Africanism. Whilst we are saying that, we have to also realize that <clears throat> the people of the old diaspora are themselves over-exploited yes. and they've been brutalized here. So what because, is Africa offering because there? At the, because at the end of the day, you understand, also plays a major role in the way the world is currently ordered. Race plays role. Right. Yeah. That's right. So what is Africa offering to the diaspora that they're going to...